listening to Wake Up Hollywood with Nikki Corula and Eddie Pence right here on LA Talk Radio. Wake up, Hollywood. This is your host of the most, Nikki Carula. We're going to jump right into this episode. Happy New Year, everybody. We have a very talented writer and director joining us today, Mr. Mayank Deo Gankar. Did I say your last name right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's Deo Gauker. Deo Gauker. How does it yeah. become a W in there? I see an N. Yeah, it's the, the N is, is kind of like silent, I guess. Oh, I didn't know that. It sneaks that's in. Cool. I don't know. So it's Deo Gaukar? Deo Gaukar, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. That's awesome. I love that. Um, so first, where is where are you where's your family from? I know you're an Indian, like me, but uh <laughs> what, what part of India are you your family from? Yeah, uh we're originally from uh, Maharashtra, so we're Marathi. Um family is mostly mostly based in uh Nagpur, India. Um wow. But yeah, I grew up all around, so I don't really consider myself like from one part of India or from one, even from one part of the world, you know, like moved around so much that I'm just like, <laughs> I'm here. Yeah, I saw that you grew up in the UK for a little bit. Like mm -hmm. how, old, how old were you when you lived there? Um, I was, we, we, we moved there twice, actually. So we had two stints in the UK, um, both for like a couple of years here and there. So I was quite young, like. I don't remember much of it, like probably around eight, nine, 10, 12, like that. So it wasn't, it was, I was quite young. It was the US is basically where I've grown up from, that let's say, seventh grade onwards, has been the US. So. so you're a coconut like me, man. <laughs> yeah, in a way, yes, yes. Do you speak Hindi or Tamil or any of those languages? Uh, so I speak Hindi. Um, yeah, I'm like multilingual, like most of us immigrants are. Um, I English is kind of my main language, but you know, I speak Hindi, I also speak Marathi a little bit. Wow. Um, and yeah, you got to be a polyglot, right? From where we come, so that's right. You know, I, I my brother and I tease my parents because they only used to speak Hindi to each other or, <laughs> or Malayalam, um, where my family's from, just when they wanted us to not know what they were talking about. So they never, <laughs> never actually infiltrated the, the language into to either of our lives in that way. So we always kind of, you know, we tease them about that, but that's awesome. That's, that can't be easy to learn all those languages and then live in so many different cultures. Tell me what that was like for you. Yeah. I mean, I was born in India. So like learning in the sense, like that's, that's, that was my mother tongue, right? So Hindi in, in our house, even though our family is Maharashtran, uh, we spoke Hindi mostly. So wow. like, um, uh, that's kind of, I grew up on Hindi and then we moved to the UK and then, you know, of course, English, and that is like proper English, if you want to call it. So, um, that was a very different, uh, thing. Then I only had that accent as a kid, you know, a British, very, if you can right. imagine like a very British accent. And then, um, then we moved around again, then to the U S and even in the U S it was like, we lived in Arizona as well. So. It's like I had like a weird morph. My accent morphed so much that now it's just this, which it shifts. You know, when I go to India, I have a slightly thicker Indian accent when I'm here. It just automatically shifts. But yeah, it's. I will say as a kid growing up, it was definitely annoying. You know, we'd move a lot. You know, you'd make friends and you'd be like, oh, okay, now we're moving. But um I would say, yeah. And I would say in hindsight, though, like it, uh, it was very, uh, how, I don't know how to word it properly, but very much so that it made me more, I feel inclusive in the sense that I, 
I was around so many different types of folks that it just became like, I never looked at the other as the other. Like, I'm like, oh, this is just a new person I can engage with and interact with. So, well, that's also intimidating too, as a kid to go to so many new schools and new countries. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, a lot of people don't realize when you went to the UK, you were probably in boarding school because that's kind of like what the the normal is. Did you go to a boarding school and kind of like there was a little bit of a transition when you did that? Uh, yeah, it wasn't really a, I don't know, it wasn't really a boarding school per se, but it was definitely a very different experience. Um, it was what you would, what we would say in the US is a private school, but in the UK, they call it a public school. It's basically like a uh, bit formal, um, you know, wearing uniforms, like, you know, it was very, very much a strict kind of um, strict kind of environment. Um, so that was a very different experience. And then coming to the U.S., I went to a U.S. public school, which was which is not the same as a U.K. public school. U.S. public school is very just just uh, I guess you would compare it to a government school. Maybe I'm not sure what the comparison would be, but it's it's very much like you know people have a dress code but it's not like there's no uniforms you wear what you want and then you uh you know it's a very freeing kind of vibe and that was the first time i went to an american school it was a very different kind of like culture shock i was like the first day i showed up i remember i, I wore like what i was used to wearing which was like you know a uh, formal shirt pants and then i showed up and everybody's like in jeans and t-shirts and i'm like yeah. <laughs> What? What? Why did I dress up for this? Yeah, why did I dress up for this? Um, so yeah, it's definitely, definitely um a culture shock. For and sure. what about that? What about the actual schooling? Like, do, I mean, we have recess here. You probably didn't have that in the same way. You probably had like classes that were as like doing you know physical activity or or like what kind of sports did you kind of do when you were in kid when, when you were a kid over in the UK? Um, yeah, we did a lot of, um, cricket and a lot of, uh, soccer or football. Um, and yeah, you, it was, it, that's definitely a thing. Cricket was definitely huge. Um, a lot you of cricket camps. I still, I still don't understand that game a hundred percent. Well, I mean, gr growing up in India, you kind of just, you know, you live cricket for a long time you know we would play in the streets and we'd get together we'd have we had this colony so the colony kids would get together in the local like parking lot and we'd play and like so i grew up on cricket when then i came to the uk there was a lot of football or soccer um and i remember like, we lived in newcastle uh, upon tyne which at the time i don't know how much you know about uh football uh uh it's it's it was newcastle united was one of the bigger teams and would like so we actually had like I went to a camp where Michael Shearer, who was one of the biggest players wow. at the time, uh, came and then he taught us for like a couple of weeks. So amazing. It was, yeah, it was I didn't know at the time again at the time, like I was like, oh, cool, local, like local hero kind of person. But then in hindsight, I'm like, wow, I got to experience like a legend. So. Yeah. yeah, it's like one of those things you think it's a casual thing that everybody you think every neighborhood gets this kind of treatment, but right? It's not that way. And also, he was your neighborhood's hero on, as far as like an athlete, but you didn't think he's like a global sensation because right. he's your he's your neighborhood team's player. You know what I mean? Yeah. So when did you fall in love with film? Like, did you have family nights where you watch movies? Was it your escape from like school and just like hanging out with friends? Like, tell me when you fell in love with movies. Yeah, I mean, I was always in love with movies, honestly. Um, but I would say like the defining moment uh, is probably one. So we did have movie nights, that's for sure. Me, my mom and my dad would get together um, and watch movies. Um, and, you know, my dad and me were more into it. My mom was more, she was like, she was, uh, professional but she was also like the home homemaker as well so she would come in and out like she would be cooking or something and then come in and watch like 15 20 minutes then go back and then every time she'd come in she'd be like okay so what's happening yes yes absolutely but she was always like she was never not until later where she was very much into it uh but yeah before it was very much like that so i remember those nights quite well um but the real uh, 
kind of moment was me and my father, we were watching a, uh, for the first time in entirety, a movie called Shole, which is a very classic Indian, but like film, uh, which uh, on its own is genius for so many, so many different reasons when it comes to Bollywood history. Um, but for me, it was very important because, so my father was a big fan of Amitabh Bachchan, who is again, a legend, uh, legendary actor, <clears throat> excuse me, and in these are India. All, these are all Bollywood movies. Yes. Just in case our, our viewers are like, Right, what? exactly, yeah. Right. They, right. they are, uh, yeah, that's what I grew up on. I grew up on Bollywood, because I grew up most, like, start southern India, so that's, that's the industry, that's the kind of film that I grew up watching. Um, so we were watching Shole, and he was a big fan of Amitabh Bachchan, and he would spot the dialogues, like, word by word, verbatim, and he would know <clears throat> exactly what's going to happen, where the music cues would come in. Wow. And I, I remember when I saw that, it was eye-opening because it was the first time I saw my, <laughs> I realized that my father can emote. Like, he actually has the ability to smile and laugh and, you know, uh, get really enthusiastic about something. Um, and I realized that it was, there's was something about this thing that we're uh, experiencing, this film, this, this thing that's on the screen that's connected with him. Right. Um, maybe it was the memory of the first time watching it because Shole is a classic. He watched it like when it came out and I was watching it with him on TV. So maybe that's that. Maybe there's something about celluloids, like just the fantasy of an adventure. <clears throat> so, I was like, there's some magic here that's happening that I I need to investigate because I, I don't know what it is. Well, it sounds um, like it was like bridging the gap between yeah. the generations of your, you know, the generation between your father and yourself. And you found this common ground, which is like, well, I like this and he likes it too. And it opens all these doors, you know what I mean? Just in communication, just because you can share in something that's not academic, not like, you know, family related in the sense that you're like hanging out with a bunch of relatives outside of family where it like right. feels like work sometimes, but you're just enjoying the presence of the film and your father. You know what I mean? It's yeah. bonding. So that must have been a pretty magical moment, you know, just to discover that. Yeah, it was it was amazing. And it was it was something again that made me realize that film has a power that um i mean visual medium in general art i would go even just broader art has a power to penetrate through the conscious of anybody and but it I, has a power I, I, to you have a point. You unite have a point. Uh, film is like the most powerful medium i think of all yeah it incorporates music and incorporates art it incorporates dance or movement or rhythm on that mm -hmm. level and it's kind of like you know it, it is a cinematic moment because it's all done you know bringing it to your screen whatever screen that is and these days that screen can be a cell phone it can be a right. screen it can be a tv screen but it's still a way that you capture the medium and present it and that it has something that you know takes a, a, a very involved amount of methods to create it in its entirety mm -hmm. between the filming, the editing, sound, actors, all of it. I think it is the ultimate yeah. medium for sure. Yeah, no, it's I, you know, I would say like art in general is very powerful, but you're right. Film is one of those things that brings all elements of art. Yeah. Visual, auditory, uh, writing, literary, like everything put together um you know that they call it i guess moving picture so right like so it's it's everything you know it's it's every element put together to give you hopefully a very enjoyable entertaining experience and it's the only place that you know a lot of the times nowadays we're seeing a lot of films like via social media or some way that are kind of using being used as tools to divide you know like hey like you know, being very political or something, but I think film as as a medium is probably one of the bigger unifiers. Yeah. Um, because you'll have again, I'll I'll go into my comfort zone of Bollywood because that's where I live mostly. Right. Um, 
But you have like, let's take a big, big star like Shah Rukh Khan, who is global, global star. He's got fans from Japan to Hawaii. Like he's got fans everywhere. Right. You've got somebody from Europe and Germany that uh, likes the same movies as a a middle class person in New in Mumbai. Yep. You know, like it, it's he's, that love Bollywood films. Huge, exactly. It's huge in Iran. It's like crazy. Yeah. And I, I'm like, when I learned how big like the market is for Bollywood films, it kind of astounded me because it's like, you don't think when you're from there, like the, the funny thing about me is like, I grew up being fascinated with Western culture. So mm -hmm. like Western music, Western films. And I know very little about Bollywood films and it's a part of, my culture but i know very little about it so it's so interesting that that was your first experience into loving film and how your father loved it too and so there must have been like a lot of musical elements that your father loved as far as music in film as well because that's what Bol when i think of bollywood films i always think of like they're like indian musicals you know so there's yeah music and theater in, in so much of a, a, a in the way that it's presented you know yeah, no, for sure. Um, again, it's 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 things that I learned over the years, and that was the first step into it. Where, you know, he resonates with classic um, Bollywood and classic music a bit more uh, than nowadays. So, like, you know, um, and if you think of like a classic Bollywood, there's a lot of elements of old school, you know, rock and old school coming in you know you look at rd berman or uh even as, as like you know those they they kind of took the western um elements uh of like jazz and um rock and brought them into rock and roll and brought them into indian kind of musical subconscious so yeah he's a big fan of those kind of that kind of music and there's one thing as I think he mentioned or someone I know mentioned where there's a differentiation of like back in the day, Bollywood music used to be um, uh, mel melodious and thoughtful where now it's just solely focused on beat. Uh, wow. And that I that rings true. Like you listen to songs nowadays, maybe even outside of Bollywood, I would say a yeah, lot of songs very, nowadays very focus on beat yep. versus melody. Yeah. So yeah that's so he's more of the mel melodious generation versus... what, what's really interesting about what you said earlier i wanted to talk about that you said you know film and art in general are unifiers my mom i had this really cool conversation with my mom once <clears throat> and uh she said she said she really believes the artists will be the people that actually unite the world and i'm mm -hmm. like you're absolutely correct and i kind of feel like sometimes sports can do that too but really it can also divide us because you're you're so you know into a certain sports team or a sport but mm -hmm. like when it comes to art it really does bring a lot of people together from so many diverse backgrounds and it's not something that is uh you know geographically destined you know it's like right you can be into music you've never heard of from another country and it just draws you in because of the elements that make up that song or that film or the way it looks or, you know, a certain dance or a certain certain writing. And it, that's what makes it so beautiful. It's like it, it can respond within all of us because it, it documents the human condition. And it mm -hmm. also, you know, kind of like helps us to congregate and kind of like acknowledge our differences in a united way which does not happen anymore you know what i mean you don't see True. that there's so much you know that's going on now did you fall in love with western film as well or did that take a lot longer because you were just more into bollywood um no i did yeah i did definitely so what happened was when i kind of put my interest of film out there um and to my family saying hey i want to do this i'm really interested in this um i remember uh, this is kind of the very Indian nature of Indian parents where it's like um, my mom was like super supportive, but she's like, if you're going to do this, do this properly. So she's like, here's a few courses, like summer courses, go, go take these and then figure out what all this stuff is about. Cause you look from the outside, Hey, film, 
you know, glamour, glitz, awesomeness. But what does it take to make a movie, right? What does it take? So learn it. So I remember going to my first summer uh, course in uh, Manhattan at the New York Film Academy. Um, and it was a summer course. I was still in high school. And we that was when I kind of really delved into Western cinema. Like, I, I knew about it, of course. I knew, I mean, I knew about Star Wars. And I knew about, like, I would watch shows. We would watch TV shows a lot, NCIS and Law and & Order. And, like, again, all of this stuff is there. But the art of learning film and how it works, um, that was at that course where we delved into um, the classic, the legends, you know, Akira Kurosawa, and then you go yeah. into like later on, like Scorsese, and that's that's when I really started delving into like legendary filmmakers and actually really watching their films as a way to understand how film is made. Right. Um, and now I would just say, like in general, like I am just a film lover at this point. Like I'll watch anything and everything. Yes. Um, from anywhere, global. Yeah, so. you, know, you know, I'm learning that some of the best stories are international stories. Mm -hmm. so I've gotten into, I have, I what I notice about myself is uh, I get really into a certain genre of film. So mm -hmm. like I will get into documentaries like big time. Mm -hmm. And then I will totally abandon documentaries for the moment <laughs> and get way into international film. And mm -hmm. I just fall in love with international stories and just, great movies like cinematic like uh like f uh accomplishments you know what i mean mm -hmm. and then i come back and i go through a classics phase mm. and i'm like way into old film to understand like this is why this is brilliant so like you know like i i hadn't seen the godfather trilogy so i watched that about mm. five years ago and i watched them all and i was like how have i never seen the godfather <laughs> this is crazy and so like now i'm like I'm kind of like I try to kind of dabble in each of them and just do like two movies and then move on to the next. But there was a time where I was just like so into the art form by genre that I would spend like a month or two and just mm. watch as many films in that you know genre as possible. But man, honestly, what I love about film is it encapsulates the human condition in such a beautiful way, mm -hmm. but it also challenges you to learn about another way of living, another kind of part of the world, another decade of living, another era or, you know, um, generation right. of musicians or artists or whatever it is. And it kind of tells you this story in a way that is, you know, you're able to access something like this in two hours, which is crazy. Like if you think about it, a documentary or even any a Bollywood movie you're sitting there. And this is what I love about movies. You're getting these stories thrown to you mm. in two hours. And by the end of it, you've seen something that challenges your beliefs. You've, you've learned something about something you never knew. You mm. laughed about something you never thought would be so funny. And these kind of like movies are the things that document your life. Like when you remember yep. what, saw et or star, you brought up star wars perfect example mm -hmm. i remember when you know like when you were talking about how you fell in love with movies for me with star wars when i first saw star wars as a kid i was like there's <laughs> nothing greater than seeing i still remember the feeling of seeing return of the jedi oh and wow the, and like that was a monumental experience that's that's what made me fall in love with movies and i love that you still love movies like that do you still go out and see movies Oh yeah, I I'm a huge uh, theater person. You know, I've got I've got the I don't know if we can do brand names, but I've got that specific yeah. like subscription. The you know monthly like I pay monthly fees and I go like watch three four movies a month. Like that's, that's awesome. That's what well, I do. Ever, um, go see a movie with I'm always looking to go see movies. I love movies, man. Yeah, of course. Uh, I I'm because that's I feel like of course recent uh events uh, kind of made us all little hermits and right. we watching we were watching stuff on smaller screens and um i know i know some people that watch whole movies on their phones like two hour movies on their phones and you know if that works for you great you're an audience member i respect it but movies film is meant to be a collective experience it's right. It's it's there's a reason somebody put in time, effort, bunch of money in order to 
create something and then more money to put it out on a big screen theater. Um, and still, you know, there are people that are like, oh, I'd, ra I'd rather watch it at home. And I, that's fine. Again, it's, it's an, from an audience's perspective, I get it. It's comfortable. It's you're at home and you can go on your own pace. You can pause the film if you want to take a break. Um, but I feel like films are a collective experience. And Absolutely. anybody who says otherwise, like theaters are going to go away, they aren't going away. I, I say we might move to a technological advancement where the collective experience of it might change. But right. the idea of the collective experience, I don't think that's going to go away. It's just, it's films. No, there's are, nothing yeah. more exciting when you see a movie with a packed movie house and everybody's mm -hmm. reacting to the same things at the same time, clapping, laughing. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, or if something scares people. I mean, it's intense to have a group experience like that. And that's what makes, I think that's what makes movie houses so iconic for me i mm -hmm. always love going to see movies in a theater because of that experience even if it's like six people in the theater it doesn't matter it's like <laughs> okay all of a sudden now you're watching something and experiencing something together so tell me how this shaped you as a filmmaker because now you've learned you've gone through school you've taken these classes did you go to film school after high school uh not right away uh i got my <laughs> got my bachelor's in political science and then I, and sociology. And then I did a stint in law school. And then um, I realized that this was just pushing the inevitable and ended up uh, coming out to LA uh, for going, for pursuing my master's. And then um, that was film school. Like that was my true film school. Um, and then just, yeah, uh, I've been, doing that since where then. did you do your masters sorry where did you do your masters for film uh new york film academy oh Here. amazing yeah, yeah. awesome so you, you put you in the environment and what was the biggest thing that you learned when you were in school like you're obviously in this is what i learned going to music school it's like all of a sudden you're in the company of artists and people mm. that love what you love and it's like I, like man some of my favorite times in music school weren't the classes it was the <laughs> hangs with people talking about movies or films or things that inspired them and learning about musicians or movies or poetry or paintings that you were just like, I've never heard of this. And they're like, oh my God, let me show you this stuff. Like what was film school like for you coming into this culture and kind of like, like adapting to this new world? Yeah, I would say it was a very similar experience. Um, you know, you're around um a group of artists uh basically and and everybody comes from different backgrounds but uh and they might have different perspectives on right. how to shoot something or what films are good and what films are bad but um at the end of the day the the pursuit is the same and that is to tell stories so you're among storytellers so yeah it was it's it was definitely a very um very uh, very nice to be around folks that understood that, um, that we're all here for a, the same purpose, you know, we're, right. we're all here to pursue that same, to learn more about the art of storytelling. That's why we're here. So, and it was definitely, you know, we had a film history class and that was one of my favorites. I, I, I love practical stuff and I love doing things on set but I really, really enjoy delving into the history of stuff right? Uh, and cinema. You know, a lot, of this, a lot of the things that we learned, I remember I had never seen, speaking of like you said, you'd never seen Godfather. I had never seen Casablanca until film school. I still haven't seen it. I still haven't seen it. <laughs> and uh, same with uh, Citizen Kane, you know, like I'd never seen those until film school. And I remember watching Casablanca, the black and white version, and um same with um citizen kane and just uh completely be engrossed uh, especially with casablanca just be engrossed with everything and it was such a um such a wonderful story and if you ha if you haven't seen it you should you know even the listeners if you haven't seen it you should definitely see it um it's it's a classic for a reason you know it's 
It, t- it takes place in Morocco, doesn't it? Doesn't it take place? In- yeah, yeah, it takes place there. It takes place in a particular time period. It also the a little interesting tidbit of history. Um, it takes it. It was shot uh, in a time where Hollywood was going through a very kind of sensory era called the haze. There was a haze code involved. So basically, it was where you couldn't show certain things on film. And, you know, uh, that was one of the last films to be part of that. Um, so there's a very particular, it's a bit of a spoiler. I don't, I don't know if you care. I've seen it. I've seen it. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. But um, at kind of the base story is, you know, like, um, uh, basically they come to this character Rick's Cafe and uh, there's, a, there's a past love affair that this woman has with her, with him. Um, uh, but she's married at this point. I believe it's married or engaged at this point. And the the whole story takes like about their past love affair. Is she, will they, won't they? And then at the end of it, she sticks with the husband. And, you know, that's seen as one of the, again, uh, finer storytelling things. But one thing that most people don't know is because it was part of the Hayes Code, as a writer during that time, you couldn't show adultery. So... Wow. Like it wasn't really a choice for her character if she was already married for her to, you know, they talk about sacrifice of Casablanca and her character. Like he sacrificed his love for the war effort, basically. And the thing is, he didn't have a choice <laughs> as a character but because like if Casablanca was made a few years later, who knows? It could have ended differently and it wouldn't have mis- maybe been the same film and it probably maybe would not have been a classic. So. Right. It's like, I love when all of those things, when you look at all of that stuff and you say that this, this is why it is, it had to happen at that moment. And it's a classic because it was made like that. So I love that. I love that. And you recently made a, an awesome short. I actually just watched it called Butterscotch and you've been winning yes. some awards for it. And I got to tell you, I didn't know what it was going to be about. And it really hit home because it's about a kid living in a South Asian household and Mm -hmm. getting the pressure to do academics and she wants to be an artist. And it really hit home for me because that that's been my (laughs) life. It's like, you know, I, I, I came from a very academic family and I still come from a very academic family and I wanted to be an artist and I know what that pursuit is like. And it's not easy, especially for South east asian families or artists you know uh on Mm -hmm. both sides because it's like when you have a passion you you don't want it to be predestined you don't want your life to be that's not what life's about it's about the unexpected it's about the unknown so i love that you make this film about that let's check out the trailer real quick and then we'll talk about the movie here's the trailer for butterscotch Man, that's gonna, that's gonna be cool. How did you figure out how to make the trailer? Because I know that's such a specific thing, and also it's very hard because your film is 15 minutes long, and it's like yeah. you have a couple seconds to like tell the story. How did you figure out what scenes to use? Yeah, you know, put, putting a trailer together is difficult at the best of times. Um, and the thing is, yeah, we only have about 15 minutes of footage, so doing like a one minute trailer for a 15 minute, like it doesn't make sense because it's so I was like, it has to be like 30 seconds. It can't really go more. And there was a choice to be made, whether we put any dialogue in it or not. Um, And I, I really, as a viewer, I love watching vague trailers, like (laughs) trailers that maybe touch you emotionally, but they don't um, like, they don't tell you much. Like what the movie's about or you know that that way you're like oh i i wonder what the film's about let me watch this um so yeah that's why we chose no dialogues and we chose like not to you know um focus too much on 
giving much of the story away. So what I think what you see in the trailer is these two characters, something happens. There's a, there's a paper. So you're like something happens between them and then they're put on two opposites. And it's also not the whole story because as you've seen the film that that's not where we finish, you know? So it's kind of like, I'm giving you, you know, like, Hey, this, I'm giving you a bit. So maybe you can watch it and see what happens. Next. Well, what's also interesting too, like uh, having seen the film, like you took very dramatic parts. You're like, <laughs> I'm gonna give you some juicy dramatic parts of the trailer. Yeah, and it's kind of cool that you did that because it makes it like, oh my god, this is this is intense. But it's really like a really simple story and something yeah. I know every Asian artist can relate to because you know it's it's like academics are very important in the Southeast Asian community. It's like mm -hmm. people don't really understand how much that is an emphasis on how you should guide your life and career with mm -hmm. academics. You know, that's like a staple. And you're creating a story where I think a lot of artists can relate to this, where it's like, yo, I'm going to do all this but when it comes time to, for me to choose my life, I'm going to choose what I want to do. And that alone is a very like revolutionary concept, especially because in Southeast Asian cultures, most of the time the parents kind of they influence what the kid should do as a career. Right. So, so that they can <laughs> tell their friends about what their kid's doing as a career, yeah. whether or not it makes them happy. So tell me what, what was the inspiration behind this for you as an artist? Well, um, that was a lot, a lot of it that you just uh, said, like a lot of that, um, where, you know, it, it, I, I've seen, uh, I won't say I will, I will admit, I probably didn't face as much uh, resistance as I kind of mentioned before, you know, um, actually my, my, my father and mother were both artists in their own rights. You know, my father is, uh, a, like he's, he's a poet, he loves to write. And, uh, my mother was a musician, uh, an Indian classical musician. So she played the sitar. So, wow. yeah. And I, I would accompany her on tabla back in the day. Uh, so That's awesome. it's, I, it's, we'll have to jam sometime because I'm <laughs> terrible with I, I haven't played in years, honestly. So <laughs> I don't know how good I am anymore, but, um, but so like the art, arts were always uh encouraged um and when i told my you know i told my mom hey i want to be a filmmaker like i want i'm interested in films and you know the next day she's like here's like 10 programs you should check this out so they they've always encouraged me that was always there um but i i there's also that kind of thing in the back of the mind that you don't go into it blind you know you have a backup you have that's the more traditional elements of Indian parenting coming in, a, you know, like, you know, you should have a backup, you should have some solid contingencies if this doesn't work out kind of deal. So I did face a version of that, not exactly what the uh, the daughter faces in Butterscotch, but um, kind of similar. So I wrote, I wrote the story out of just wanting to talk about it and maybe providing a different perspective also from the parent side um, which I think there's a lot of stories about artists, children that don't necessarily get their way. Um, but I think we don't really see much stories where we find out why their parents behave the way they do right. and why they, they want what they would consider a better path, better career path, better path in life. Um, and of course, in a short, you don't have much time to delve too deep into many things. But, you know, I, I hope, you know, a little bit of like the reasoning behind the mother's um, choices on why she uh, is a little bit controlling, um, it comes out. You know, I hope that comes out a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, another thing I wanted to uh, encourage is... Um, kind of this idea of communication because parents and children, especially those on two different sides of an issue, don't always communicate right. and they put up a wall and that's, that ha this happened many times. And I think that this story, I wanted to show that one side has to be like, hey, we need to talk. We have to talk about this. 
Um, so yeah, I, I, and I, I'll, I just want to say, like, you know, you're talking about South Asian uh, cult uh, parents and South Asian story, but this, this particular story is a little more broad. You know, it's not just um, Asian culture because I, we've been taking it through festivals, and we were in like Cincinnati, um, which is our first, uh, first like world premiere, and there was an audience member uh, who was from kind of rural Ohio who had come to see the festival and she was a teacher uh, and she was a white American rural Ohio teacher. And she's like, this, this movie should be shown to uh, parents because it's, it's, you know, a lot of parents have trouble figuring out why their kids behave the way they do. And it's like, yeah, that that's this, this is why I'm showing this to these people. This is why I created this so that it can, Kind of, you know, open the dialogue, hope. open the dialogue, basically. Well, exactly. what's also really cool too. It's like you show the, the she has the, the, you know, the daughter has the ability. You can see it in the first moment. And what's really cool about your movie is how you link the butterscotch <laughs> the ice cream, yeah, to the two characters. Because I'll tell you, when when I first saw the butterscotch ice cream, I was like, how the hell? Why? what you know i was like how is this gonna tie in like this is crazy and it's endearing how you kind mm -hmm. of like bring it as it's almost like an offering you know like how you bring yeah. some between these two characters that that are you know not seeing eye to eye in a lot of ways and, mm -hmm. and the cool thing that you do too is you show these characters kind of like um reflecting on their on their own things their own demons in a negative way and you know the uncertainty of the unknown is definitely presented but it's also like you do it in a way where you you show each character individually separate of the other character kind of going into the depths of their own like path and figuring mm -hmm. out how to come <clears throat> how to come to the crossroads and walk through the fire you know what i mean so um do you think there was a moment when you were writing this where you felt like you had that moment in your own life where it was like, okay, this is my crossroads. This is what I know I, what I have to do because it's so poignant that you're an artist in a South Asian family. And then you mm -hmm. wrote something that is what every South Asian family probably secretly deals with that nobody talks about within the South Asian community. Yeah. Um, Funnily enough, I think this film is that crossroads. Um, it's it's when I showed it to my father, showed it to my grandparents, um, and you know, immediately there was a sense of pride that they had, which you know, and I'm sure, like, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to diss my dad. He, I know, I know, I'm sure he, I know he loves me, and I know he, um, he is proud of me. But you know how parents can be a bit. Uh, yeah. especially fathers can be a little conservative with their emotions. So um, it wasn't until he saw the film where he was like, this is good. And that, that was the crossroads in my, in my kind of journey where I'm, I, I created something and I showed it to them and they're like, this is actually pretty good. Um, so it's like, it wasn't a complete waste in that sense. Right, so, right. Well, um, it's also cool that they, they were supportive. Yeah. It could have gone the other way where they're like, what is this that you're doing? You know what I mean? Like, oh man, I yeah. went to work and I spent all this money and time, and <laughs> and now you guys are saying this. You know what I mean? So, and I like that you use the short medium. Like I love short films. It's like yeah, uh, it's a very underrated uh, medium, and it tells very effective stories in a concise amount of time for a reason. And that's the beauty of the art form. I, it's like. Mm -hmm. I, I love when shorts give you a beginning, middle, and end, and you're like, oh, yeah, this is a fantastic story, and this could have been a feature. You know what I mean? So do you yeah. do you have, like, a, a hope for this to be a feature, or is this just, like, one part, one facet of a bigger story? Um, I mean, I didn't I didn't make it in the hopes of expanding it. I think it's it's uh, kind of a glimpse into the life of these characters. Right. And um, we have seen that. And of course, all characters, as a writer as well, like all characters, I'd love to explore and expand. But I think this lives 
in that time frame. Like that's the story. Um, that's not to say that other aspects of similar life cannot be explored, you know, other aspects of like parent child dynamics or, uh, old generation, new generation dynamics, or, you know, like, um, a, a, NRIs versus people in India dynamics, like those are all there, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's things worth exploring for sure. But for me, butterscotch lives in those 15 minutes. Like that's, that's where it stays. Um, but yeah, and I, I do hope that, you know, the more people, the more people watch it and, you know, um, watch it and they I hope they are able to uh, realize that you know wherever you come from where wherever whatever path you choose as long as there's honest and open and sincere communication um, that uh, you can always get beyond the hurt and you can always get beyond the differences well there uh, has to be, there has to be heart and whatever yeah Whatever the path, that has to be the reason for taking the path. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. if you don't have heart, then there's no sense of communication. I've got a technical question, a couple of te technical mm -hmm. questions. Sure. So, like, I'm going through a, a video series right now that I'm kind of directing and producing. That, now, what did you shoot it on, and how many cameras did you shoot it on? And the <laughs> second question is an editing question. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you – you really edited this very beautifully. Like, I, I really acknowledge – really great editing when I see it. And it's something I'm learning is kind of a, its own art form, you know, because yeah. like, editing really tells a story in a lot of ways and in all, in all the right ways. So first, what did you shoot it on? How many cameras did you shoot it on? And then when it came to the editing process, what was your philosophy and kind of like, you know, form of editing the project? Yeah, so we shot it on a, a red I think it was a red dragon and um so our director of photography uh Ritik Reddy he's a genius guy uh and he was able to let us have this amazing piece of tech you know the red dragon is a beautiful beautiful camera yeah. and what we ended up doing it's a single camera setup it was one camera um and what we ended up doing was he's he's somebody like me who kind of loves to fuse new tech with old so we used the red we reused the red and then we added old, um, I believe they're called Leica lenses, like vintage lenses on there. So basically, like the you kind of, I don't know if you noticed uh, that there's a bit of a filmy grain to it. Like it felt cinematic, and that's that's the lenses. That's that's what the lenses are bringing. Um, and that was his idea. He's like, I'd love to shoot this with vintage lenses. So that's what we did. We kind of fused new tech with old tech and really gave a, we had the breadth of for, as an editor, I had all this, a big canvas to edit with like big, big, we shot in 6k, I want to say. So like big canvas to edit with. Um, but then we also had the, uh, texture of film, right. which I thought was very, very cool. Um, and as an, as from the editing perspective, it was, <laughs> it was funny because the script, the script itself is a nine page script. So, wow. I mean, if you know the one minute, one page yeah. rule, it's like, it should be a nine minute film. Yeah. But when we shot it, it, it just ended up being much longer. So was that because I, the, the character asides or yeah, moments yeah. Of, like, of quiet, like within their minds? Exactly. That took a little bit longer? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, on script, it was like, you know, uh, Maya, who's the mother, like Maya contemplates her daughter's words. And that's the shot in front of the mirror. And and also when she's looking through her old things, like th that whole thing in, is like two sentences <laughs> in the script. So of course on screen, it's much longer. So, um, but because of that, the whole sequence where the daughter gets angry and tears everything up, um that sequence was originally shot as a one shot so we shot everything together but this was something that you're asking about the editing where when i was looking at it as a one shot it felt 
almost disconnected with the emotions she was feeling to me as an editor because yeah the performance was great you know mehek uh, and shri sora who was shri sora as the mother mehek was the daughter they gave amazing performances um but I, as i was editing it um and there's a cut where the whole one shot of that we're tearing the whole thing down is there but i would i just felt like if i'm that character i'm disjointed you know yeah. i'm i'm not thinking straight the rage the upset the sadness has taken over so i was like it has to be jarring it can't be it can't be a, like one take shaky like it has to be like oh she comes in cut she she goes paces cut she you know sits thinks gets that like all that has to be a bit jarring because that's how she's feeling at the moment right um so yeah those choices had to be made and um speaking of music there was a big big decision of whether we put music in that particular sequence or not um and there's a cut where there's music in that sequence but i decided not to go with it you so because because the emotion was in the image the emotion was in the image and whatever score we were putting felt way too much musically to me and i didn't feel like we could do justice to the performance if we overshadowed it with the music right. so like and the music again with another like a lot of south asian uh, crew behind this project as well so uh, Mayuresh Mardgaukar, who's a Mumbai-based uh, musician, uh, amazing, amazing musician, um, composer. Uh, he did the he did the score. So all of that was original soundtrack, original score uh, for the for the movie. And uh, that was a discussion me and him had, where it's like he thought that we needed the music, but then once he saw it necessarily without it, then you know it, it it's it's like as a musician, I'm sure you understand too, like oh, we need music and it can heighten. It definitely can heighten. But sometimes I feel like I'll watch a movie and it'll be like, man, I don't know if we needed that much music for well, this particular so scene. also needs space. Like, yeah. space is what creates some of the emotion too because yeah. you have a, like an inhale and then you have the music can kind of be the, the climax or the kind of like solution the resolution to yeah whatever the dilemma is you know what i mean so sometimes yeah. the space when you're kind of like showing the conflict is enough so i actually like that it was abstract in that you know also i felt like there the 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 kind of um jolt that she receives you know that the the daughter and the mother both of them receive they both handle it differently right so the daughter gets enraged, uh, but it's one of those where I I felt that again adding music would just make it worse. <laughs> and I'm thinking if I if I get enraged like that, I'm I'm having like a almost a silent rage within me. So that's what I felt her character needed. And then while the mother does have a silent kind of upset she ends up going down late like you know she ends up going down memory lane later too so that was like you're right we needed a breath like in the right. tenseness and i wanted people to sit with the emotion i think sometimes music keeps us from sitting with that emotion because right. music cues us music says you, you have to feel this way because i'm cueing you to feel this way but it doesn't let you feel if if you want like not always however you want to feel so well you know, it was like you allowed you allowed us to stew yeah exactly like, like you you allowed us to like it, it adds the brooding element to it mm -hmm. you know, by just like allowing the visual to stand alone which is cool yeah. you know what i mean and you show the conflict you know and i also you said you said a, a silent rage i'm like my uncle, I, 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 I would, I've never seen you angry in the short time I've known you. I can't imagine you ever having silent <laughs> rage, but apparently you know enough of it that it's, it's in you to write about it because you. Well, have yeah. And the thing it. is, I have, I have a very, very long fuse. But the thing is, some people forget that I do have a fuse. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, I just, I, yeah, yeah. You got that. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you this. What is next and where can people find this movie? So right now, Butterscotch is doing its film festival circuit run. Um, it's currently uh, actually recently just got selected for the Poppy Jasper uh, International Film Fest, uh, nice. which, yeah, which takes place up in Morgan Hill in California, which I will be there if anybody's listening and is in that part of the uh, part of the state. Uh, so it's it's making its rounds it's still you know there's still a lot of uh festivals it needs to go to um so hopefully by like mid to later this year we'll have it at a distributor or somewhere on a streaming platform or online somewhere uh fingers crossed um but yeah hopefully uh you guys can you know see it uh somewhere at a fest hopefully in la as well there's there's a lot of fests that are still have yet to you know uh give us our decisions um but that's yeah that's and part of the process it's like yeah you make something really beautiful and then you wait for someone else to interpret it for mm -hmm. whatever reasons whether it gets into uh, a major festival or a smaller festival it's like man it's so this is what i don't like about art it, and you know I, I had a meeting with a a, a very <clears throat> good, uh, executive producer for documentaries and he said you know the art there's no suffering in the art. The suffering comes when after the art is finished. And we <laughs> figure out where, where people can find it and where, you know, like that's where yeah. it starts. And I was like, that is so true. It's like <laughs> finishing the craft is one thing or finishing the art is one thing. And then the other part of it is finding the audience, finding the market, mm. finding a way to get it so people can see it. So, um, but you're doing a great job. You're winning some awards. You're getting yeah. some awesome film festivals. And it's got to be super exciting. And uh, we look forward to seeing many more films from you, Mayank. I, I think it's you're a very talented film director and writer. And I hope you never stop making movies. And where can people find you if they want to find more about Butterscotch? Uh, yeah, so we're we're on uh, Instagram. Uh, we are at Butterscotch underscore the film, I believe. And uh, you can find me on Instagram as well. Uh, it's at uh, myankmd.official. Um, spell it out. Spell it out. Cause people oh, sorry. Yes. It's uh, <laughs> at uh, m-a-y-a-n-k-m-d.official. And um, we're on socials. I'm sure if you search my name, you'll find it. Uh, and yeah, I'm actually, you're asking about what's next. Uh, I am actually planning on going to India in like a month and I'm planning on shooting another short there. So that's, that's my awesome. next, that's my next thing. Very, very cool. Well, my uncle, when that's finished, you have an open invitation to come on board <laughs> and we'll do another interview with you because you're a great cat and you're a very talented dude. And we look forward to many more films from you, man. And Keep making these Thank movies you. because Butterscotch was amazing and I can't wait to see what's next for you. So thank you for being a guest on Wake Up Hollywood and you'll have to keep coming back. Every movie, you got an open open invitation to keep coming back, man. That's what Absolutely, we absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, I'm a big fan of yours and I respect your your work. So it's really great to have this uh experience in this this Just talk so you know, and conversation I, I watched your film and i was like man this guy knows how to shoot a movie <laughs> we'll have to collaborate yeah. on something man for but sure for sure look, look forward, forward to it movie and uh yeah we have to hang soon too man we'll absolutely, to talk absolutely. Shop, man. on behalf All of right. Mike, myself and sam happy new year everybody check out butterscotch at a film festival near you and soon to be released. Cross your fingers, right? Cross, cross your fingers. fingers. Cross right. all the fingers. Yes. Fingers and toes. All right. <laughs> we'll see you guys here next week. Peace, love. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Good luck in life because it's a new year. Let's make shit happen. All right. We'll see you guys next week. Peace. You're listening to Wake Up Hollywood with Nikki Corula and Eddie Pence right here on LA Talk Radio.